The Old Testament God and the New Testament God, the God that we know of reconciliation and of love and of calling his people back to him. And we get these moments in the Bible where it just seems like everything is kind of uh, intense <laughs> and maybe a little angry and um, just out of the character that we probably like to associate ourselves with when it comes to God. So the, the question we're looking at, and we're going to be, uh, if you go to the Bible app, it's there, the, the messages, the verses are there, but we're going to be in First Chronicles and Acts. Those are the two books of the Bible we're going to be in. You can turn there if you would like. And the question we're going to start to wrestle with is, how do you feel about instantaneous justice? Right? Instantaneous justice. How about uh, some examples? Uh, I always uh, relate to driving because I drive a lot, and there are a lot of people on the road who make me upset, and I have a a Christ-centered heart, but sometimes my instantaneous justice jumps out. Like when somebody cuts off, cuts you off, you just might yell at them, right? You just might say a couple of choice words, hopefully not, but you want them, and especially if they're speeding, and they do that thing where they pass you, and then they slow down, and they pass you, and they slow down. You just hope a cop is there waiting for them, right? To pull them over, to give them a ticket for that day. Carlene sent me this Kickstarter the other day. It's called uh, Wink, I think. It's this little, this digital board you put on the back, win- the back window of your car. And you're supposed to be able to say things like, Wink, have a nice day, and it will give a little thumbs up emoji, right? And it's just, you can communicate with people <laughs> around you in, in the world as you're driving, and... I quickly sent back to her that I cannot have one of those as I am a pastor and my car is a holy place and I cannot have people you know, finding out what I am saying to them <laughs> by little emojis. How about people who, who don't wash their hands when they leave the bathroom, right? You just maybe kind of hope they get sick or, yeah. Instantaneous justice, things where it just... As soon as it happens, you say they need to be punished for that. We all have these little, some people might call them pet peeves, things that just irk us and just want to (laughs) drive us mad. But are you okay with the concept of instantaneous justice when it happens to you? Like when you cut somebody off, not intentionally, of course, because you're a great driver, and you know that they are probably cussing you out behind you, do you hope that you get pulled over for a speeding ticket Probably not. Probably not. And so we're going to look at First Chronicles chapter 13, verses 9 through 10. We'll start backwards just a little bit. And this is right at the beginning of chapter 13. They're, they're moving the ark. And the ark in the Old Testament, so this is an Old Testament passage, the ark is where God resides. That's where God lives. Uh, and they built this beautiful thing for them to carry around. They can only carry it certain ways, like on the shoulders of the chosen people of the chosen people. And so David, who's the leader right here, says, David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. He then said to the whole assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our people throughout the territories of Israel and also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands to come and join us. So he's conferred with a whole bunch of people and he's talked to a whole bunch of leaders And he said, if it's right and the people agree, we're going to move this ark. So they do. They load it up on the back of this cart that's pulled by some oxen. That's where we get to chapter 9. When they came to the threshold floor of Kaidan, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah and he struck him down because he had put his hand on the ark. So he died there before God. So they're walking along. David, this great leader, has chosen this plan to carry the ark. And the oxen stumble, and the guy just reaches out to catch it, right? And that's just a natural reaction for, even if it's just not the ark of God, right? You just try and catch it. And God was so angry, killed him. It was done. That's pretty instantaneous, (laughs) if you ask me. So let's go to Acts, and we can look at a different story. Acts chapter 5 is where we want to go next. And this couple named Ananias and Sapphira. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, had sold five. Acts 5. Yep, verse 1, right at the beginning. 
Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And fear seized all who had heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked me, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down, on his feet, on, fell down at his feet and died. Then the young, young, young man came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside the husband. So here's two, this couple, sold all this, this land and had all this money that was at their disposal. Lied, not to just man, right, but to the spirit, and were just killed within three hours of each other. So how do we reconcile this with the God that's supposed to be a God of love and a God of reconciliation? Well, we know that the wages of sin is death. That's from Romans. The wages of sin is death. Are we okay with that? That's what we are destined for. Before we come to Jesus and say, I'm a sinner, save me, we are destined for death. So basically, if you lie, you die, right? If you lie, you die. It's Ten Commandments, don't lie. Now, how many people did their taxes this past, <laughs> this past week? Was everybody completely honest on their taxes? All right, nobody's, nobody's striking dead. Nobody's striking dead. Nobody's falling down and dead. Yes. If you lie, you die. That's what Romans says. So there are many people, many people, who commit crimes and commit sins that aren't dying today. We as a group of people, our society, we say that there are some sins or crimes that are worthy of death. There are 31 states in the United States, 31 states that allow the death penalty. Ohio is one of them. This week we had a court uh, that sentenced a man to die for a murder that he committed, a kidnapping and a murder, and so he's sentenced to die. So we as a society have said that it is okay for some people to be put to death for the crimes that they commit. These people... That's, that's humans passing judgment, which we could, we could talk about at a different time. But, but for committing a crime and for sin, the punishment is death. And are we okay with that? Are we okay with that? And the tension is, is real. And this is, that topic of, of corporal punishment is contested. But is sin, like lying, is sin like lying to do something the wrong way really that bad? Basically, <laughs> is lying a white lie that bad? And why doesn't it happen today? Why isn't God just striking people dead today? What do you say? <laughs> Let nobody be around. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, <laughs> when we zoom in on passages like this, it's like playing that game. You ever play a game as a kid? I don't even know if it, it's not even a game as much as like an optical illusion challenge where you zoom in so close you're trying to guess what the picture is. Right? Like a super close picture of something, you say, what is that? And you're like, oh, I think it's that. And they zoom out and it's something totally different. Well, when you look at the Bible, you just look at one or two verses and just fixate on that story. You fixate on those passages. And it could be harder to miss the whole picture. So if we step back a little bit, we're going to jump back to 1 Chronicles. So 1 Chronicles chapter 13, and we started this a little bit earlier. They put the ark on a cart instead of the Levites carrying it. So I told you there's a very certain way you're supposed to transport this, this ark, and that is the Levites are supposed to carry it uh, on poles on their shoulders. 
they probably knew this, right? They are very faithful people. They've been traveling around the world or around their region. They're very strict. They're supposed to be. And somehow it's made it past all these people where they're going to just transport it on the back of a cart with some ox, like some common piece of luggage. And so, unfortunately, this man was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so the sin of David and the other leaders causes the death of this man. In Acts chapter 5, they were put to death because they lied about how much money they gave. There was no command to sell everything and to give everything away. They just did it, and then they held some back, and they just lied. Why? I don't know. We'll have to, to ask somebody who knows the story better than us, but their own sin, they lied to the Spirit, and because of that, they were killed. So we have to stop and we have to accept and acknowledge that God is holy and God is powerful. We focus on the instantaneous moments of death as opposed to what's happening around in this moment. It's not all bad. It's not, it's not all necessarily bad because the ark is then moved to a different location where the ark is housed, where God is, God is everywhere. Where God is, that place is is blessed. If you look at Acts, right before the story of Ananias and Sapphira, 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 they prayed, the place was shaken, people were selling everything because of a compulsion, because they believed in what was happening, and they wanted to be with each other. And they wanted to be all in for the kingdom of God. Right after those two die, the apostles perform signs and wonders among the people. They go out and they heal a whole bunch of people. God is present and God is powerful. We see the blessing of the presence of God in the ark of the people. Right where the ark goes, God is. When the Holy Spirit is lived out and uh, Uh, Unleashed through the hands and feet of the people, people are healed. But on the side of uh, the flip side of the coin of mercy is justice. And sometimes we can take that for granted how powerful God is. I wonder if we, if we just even live like we expect God to work in us. So we look at this. We look at the city that we're in. We look at this this neighborhood that we're in. Do we believe that God can and is doing amazing things around us? Or do we just get used to doing the same thing over and over again, over and over again, coming to church on Sunday mornings, doing the same same things over and over again, same events every year, and we just take it for granted that we are doing doing good things and we just forget about the presence of God. I'm sure that if somebody dropped dead right here because God's justice, we would have their attention, (laughs) right? But we don't want people to drop dead. We want to be a people that share grace, and we want to be a people that share the power of God working through us and the power of the Holy Spirit working through us. So when we are praying, and we're praying that 1002 prayer of open the eyes to the harvest fields around me, I want you to really mean it. I want you to really mean I want my eyes to be opened so I know what you would have me do in this neighborhood. And then believe that God is going to work because God is powerful. God is always with us. God is always with you. And we should be living in that presence continually. This world needs empowered witnesses, and that is us. We don't go out to the park on a Saturday morning because it's fun. It is kind of fun if you make it fun, but we go out there because we love our community and we serve the community because God loves the community. We go and serve Sunday mornings and pass out drinks to people to encourage people because we love people and we are empowering people. And we meet together not because that's what we have to do, but because when we meet together, we are in the presence of the Holy Spirit together, corporately worshiping and believing that God can move in big and powerful ways and that he will move in big and powerful ways. And we aren't just sitting around and hoping for it. 
So hear, respond, and share. What did you hear? How are you going to respond? And who are you going to share it with? And then, of course, what questions do you have? They're on the back. The cards, you can get a card as you go back to get your dessert. So let me pray before we go and enjoy the desserts and ask our questions. So, Father God, thank you for empowering me. And thank you for empowering these people here who are answering your call and believing that you can do big and powerful things. Lord, I pray that you do big and powerful things through me, but I also ask that for each one of these people here who are hearing this message, whether it be right now in this room or if they listen to it later, that they are empowered and they believe that you will do big things and amazing things. That working for the kingdom of God is not is not something that we just hope for, but it's something that we believe you will empower us to do. We thank you for your love and your mercy. We ask this all through Jesus Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, is it wrong to question God when we are not seeing where he is working in our lives? And I would tie this kind of into how do we continue to walk with God and out of grace when we feel disheartened over and over again. I don't think, uh, I think there are plenty of passages in the Bible where people are angry with God. And that is an okay thing to be sometimes because as one of the emotions that we express, uh, the, the problem, uh, I, yes, it's okay, I think, to question God. He is big enough to, to take that and how do we continue to walk with God and out of grace? Whew. I, think, I think you do that with other people. I think we are in relationship. We are, we are built for relationship. The first man did not last very long before he had to have a helper and somebody to walk with. So how do we walk with God? I think we have to do it with other people because the, the truth is we cannot do it all ourselves and we will eventually be burnt out. And we will eventually, uh, if we do get to question God and we get to the point where we're angry with God and we're in that bubble by ourselves, then we will never have anybody to give us any perspective. So, and maturity happens and maturity, the more issues you go through, uh, the quicker, hopefully, that you come to recognize that God loves you and that God is there for you and you fall off to God quicker. So, join a small group. <laughs> join a small group and then join an even smaller group inside of that. If you're not a part of a small group, just let me know and I will get you plugged into one because it is, uh, it's radically different how people process through things with God when they're part of a small group in my experience with our people. Um, okay. Was God making the example of those who died? Why didn't he give them a chance to repent? Which is similar to did God use the death of Ananias and Sapphira to send a message to his people? So God created them to send a message. Seems mean. All tied into this thesis. Do you think that God of the Old Testament is, was a different God because Jesus hadn't come and died for mankind yet? Did he need to have be more wrathful in order to maintain his presence? Did the people and or times call for a frightening God instead of a gentle, loving one? Was he known as God the Father in the Old Testament? Um, hmm, that is a lot. Maybe I should have broken this. Okay. I don't think that God is gentle. <laughs> I think God is powerful and God is holy, even through Jesus. Um, that's not to say that he isn't loving and merciful. But uh, is he the same? <laughs> oh, boy. Mm -hmm. So the, the really bad thing, I just would refer you back to the first series, the first message in this series, which is, does God change his mind? Um, do you need to have, be more wrathful in order for it to maintain his presence? When we look at like Ananias and Sapphira and 
uh, Uza, I think that's how you say his name, uh, I think they are critical points in the story of God and the story of God's followers. Do I think that God killed them to make a point? I don't think so. I think that we are, like I said in Romans, we are already destined for death. And so uh, it's through God's grace that we don't have to die. Why those two people and those people uh, were killed right then in that moment, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that answer. I don't think we get a good answer in the Bible. Um, could there have been more? We just don't know. I mean, always, yeah. These are just, yeah. I mean, there could, there could have been a whole backstory, and, uh, but I just don't know the answer to that. I don't know why those people died, and we don't die every single day, but uh, I think God is the same. I think that, you know, is God different before Jesus and after Jesus? Um, I don't think so. Can I expand on that you may expand upon that so, question. Understanding the fact that God is the same always, yesterday, today, tomorrow, yeah. God never changes. Mm-hmm. Is it just that our perception of God has changed? Like the perception of the people in the Old Testament, they had a very different perception than what we have. So is it just that God doesn't change, but as we evolve and we grow, he seems to change because we are changing. Personally, I think I would tend to agree with you in that, that uh, as we understand the Bible and the history and God more as we journey with him through this life, I do think that uh, what we latch onto may be highlighted differently. And you can even see that in the, the world of Christians in our time. There are certain denominations that are very, uh, they latch onto one thing very much, very much, it's not even a correct sentence, but a lot, and then somebody else uh, does something different. So does our perception change? I think, I think so. That's where I would tend to go with it. Um, did he have to be more wrathful hmm. in order to maintain his presence? Well, and with that, because the people themselves couldn't go directly to God, they had to have an intermediary. They couldn't be in the presence of God. There was no, you know, different times, different people. Mm-hmm. It was just, did they need, did they need, did the people themselves need a scary God, you know, in order to, for their God to prove mm-hmm. himself above and beyond all of the other multitude of yeah uh, processing through this you know as like Ellen and I were just talking as a young child mm-hmm. when we went to church was, you heard about fire and brimstone and you know how you were scared. Nowadays, you don't hear that anymore. But I think it did help me as a child to have more fear of God because it kept me from doing some stuff that I knew I shouldn't know because I had that fear. I mean, I wasn't like scared like this. I was just like, I knew that if I lied, if I stole, if I murdered somebody, if I took God's name in vain or whatever, that I was, you know, definitely going against God and I had that little bit of fear. Yeah, I don't think, though, that I, the fire and brimstone movement of past was predicated on fear of hell and not a love of God. And I think the fear that we see in the Bible and the fear that we see when people encounter God is not a fear that they are going to hell, but a fear of how amazing and how wonderful and how powerful he is. And that, they, that God is holy. He's the holiest of all holies, and we can never... Uh, we can never match that. And so that's where the fear comes in. Um, yeah, so I, I don't, I don't okay, know. So yeah. I'm going to change my question. No, and it, it goes right along with what you said, because God is a holy God and we can never match that. The God in the Old Testament was very present. 
he was I, he was there. He <laughs> well, was right there. So did that have something to do with it? Because he was so there. I mean, they carried the Ark of the Covenant with them. God was in the Holy of Holies, and they knew that. I mean, he was a pillar of fire by day, and a, a, you know, by night, and a cloud by day. They had on, they had concrete evidence that God was there before them and with. Them. I'll answer this two ways. First, I would say that, uh, I mean, the pessimist would say that it was just a box. It wouldn't necessarily be concrete evidence, and it could be a pillar of fire just in the sky. But to them it was. But to them it was. And the New Testament, the, right after this Ananias and Sapphira story, Peter is going through and healing people. I don't know if Peter's, but people are throwing people into the streets. And so the New Testament God is very alive and present. We know the New Testament God is Holy Spirit. I think that same power is in the world. I think God is still just as prevalent, and perhaps we are just not the ones that are in tune with them. We're the ones that are not recognizing, because I, I think that God is moving in big ways today. So, I mean, we have, we have a whole group of kids that get to hear about God every, you know, six weeks, right? They get to cycle through it. That's, I think that's a miracle. That's God present in and uh, holy and moving in that way. So, yeah, I, don't, I think that God is always present. I don't know if he's always been unapproachable in the Old Testament. We just read that people represented through, through one person. But it's always been a corporate, as in a, a relational, a big body uh, faith as well as an individual faith. So we are all part of this um, together. So, AJ. Yeah. I just think that, going kind of along with what Aaron's saying, because if you look at the Old Testament, especially like when they first approached Mount Sinai and God spoke to all of Israel, and they told Moses, you know, you speak for us because if we hear this voice, it's going to kill us, because, and it's not because God hated them, it was because he's just so holy. And I, I felt that, and it, it could be terrifying. And I think when he gave them the law, the law was designed to show them that they're always going to miss the mark. Mm -hmm. That if they're relying on the law to be right with God, they're always going to fall short. So when Jesus came along and fulfilled all the law, then he stepped into place and satisfied that so much that wrath of God. That now we can, when he looks at us, he sees us through Jesus' righteousness that protects us. But if we still try to be under the law, then we better be able to fulfill it or we fail. And I think that's what Jesus does. He shows us that. He shows us the Old Testament God who was holy, and that's what wipes people out is that holiness, not his meanness. It's just his holiness. We can't exist in that presence. But Jesus shows us that the law actually shows us that we need a Savior. Because if we're depending on the law, then we better, better be able to fulfill it. And as humans, we can't possibly fulfill it all the time. So Jesus fulfilled us for us. And that kind of let him step, in, step into our place. Like how the, in, the, in the Old Testament... They couldn't go into the Holy of Holies except for the high priest on certain days of the year. If anybody else walked in there, they got sapped because there had to be sacrifices, clean, cleansing, and everything. But Jesus does that for us. So we can be in God's presence without facing his wrath. We, instead of his holiness destroying us, I think his holiness, we see that Jesus is our only hope. Without Jesus, we are in big trouble. This is how I see it. I would say then probably a whole lot of people in the Old Testament did not make it into heaven. <laughs> That's, I, I don't think the laws were ever supposed to be the rules to set us for, but it was the laws were set in place for us to live a holy life in the presence of a holy God. Not, we, you're right, we'll never reach perfection by the laws, but I don't think the laws were ever uh, intended originally to be that. I, I think that's what they were turned into. Um, well, the Pharisees are the ones that made all that stuff. They, they didn't follow them either. They expected the people to, but not them. Mm, yeah, that happens a lot even today, <laughs> too. Um, Good questions. 
I just want, I'll go back to, to saying this, that God is present. He was present in the Old Testament. He is present in the New Testament. Going back to Peter, when people were throwing, people saw that Peter was different, and that's why they were throwing sick people in front of him to be healed. That's not Peter. Peter wasn't the healer or the savior, but Peter was just, he was different because he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. So I think that we, we can be in the presence of God. I mean, when we say yes to Jesus, we're freed from sin. And then there's this Holy Spirit thing that happens that cleanses us further. And, and I hope that once that happens, that you live a life that is like that, that is a witness to God always. And I think that um, people have just been getting it wrong in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and today. And I'll just end it. God is always present. And God is always with us. Uh, whether you believe or don't believe, and whether you're sanctified or not sanctified, and whether you're uh, holy or not holy, God is always there. And God is powerful. Uh, good questions. They're tough this week. So thanks. Thanks for putting me in the spot. I appreciate it. No, I, I really do. I think it's good to have these conversations and to wrestle with these things.